We do this in a group. Have people start to talk about how they feel in a certain situation. Very valuable, very scary. The funny truth is that as soon as we actually know what we want and we are able to articulate what we want, the chances to get it are so much higher. I want to help you and organizations and myself, because I'm definitely not there yet, to become wholehearted, to become truly ourselves, and to create organizations where, which is the topic of this conference, we love to belong. It's taken me a long time. Speaking in front of the public is still hard to me, although I've done it a few dozen times now. Doing something interesting I haven't done before, like starting to talk by not talking, and at a conference where people usually pay 30% of their attention to devices, like me, meeting all the time, I send 10 tweets for to Stephen while he's at his for. I love doing that, so keeping people away from their devices by locking them onto a screen. That was like, can I do this? Is it okay to do this? Will you like it? Um, being really open didn't pay me well most of the time in my life. When I came to school, uh, I was very curious, very open, uh, eager to learn like one trip. And I found out that most people didn't really appreciate the way I was older. Maybe it was the wrong people. I don't know. I was fairly open again when I entered the workplace after university. The university was quite inspiring. I could go to place to do what I wanted. <coughs> I wanted to do many things that had taught me more focus. And probably was 90, so being able to type the web internet helped to get a job in spite of my university studies. Um, and I again found out that being open, being wholehearted, being fully myself wasn't really valued very much. The worst experience probably that I've been thinking was when I was nearly 30, I became managing director of a middle-sized company in Germany. There was a political game at play. The founder of the company was kind of pushed aside by the investor and they wanted to have somebody young and easily manageable at the top. And so me and another equally young guy and tried to control us. Um, it didn't work for very long, but the thing that I experienced was I was suddenly the boss. I had no idea how to do that. And the only thing I thought I knew about that job was I was not meant to ask for. Because I was the boss. Right? That didn't feel very well. And I know from other experiences and talking to a lot of managers, especially in uh, organizations where those who are good at the job are then promoted, other than Suddenly, not good at another job with this team of people. Um, I think Stephen said very beautifully people are the core of a successful business. And I think this is all we need in terms of manifestos. Right? We create organizations where we value people, period. We trust them to surprise us with amazing results. This is exactly. Uh, what I want to achieve, uh, what I'm supporting, helping people to trust themselves, to trust others, and trust their organizations and customers, uh, which is why I labeled myself a trust artist last year. It was another one of these courageous things that didn't really feel good at the time, but then worked well. You, we all, deserve to love what we do and be loved for doing it. This is my core belief. And it's still hard to say it, although I've said it a thousand times to myself and to others. Why does it feel so weird, so hard, so scary to actually say I'm special? But if I go to my head, to my left brain side, and I write down things about myself, I will probably say check for everything. Right? Oh yeah, I did Am I valuable? Yeah, in a way I'm valuable. Am I loved? Yes, I have a wife, I have a daughter, I have lots of friends, etc. But do I really dare to say I'm special? It's hard, right? Why do we hate looking into a mirror so much? And this is not about good looks, right? This is just about seeing yourself and seeing what's truly there, being all of what's there, showing what's there, right? We're so afraid to do that 
And this is because of shame. Shame is probably the strongest and maybe worst human emotion or human drive or passion, so to say. We try to avoid it at all costs. And that's why we're so afraid to stand out. Our society expects us to fit in, and the way it does it is judgment. Everything we do, every step we take, every um, project we start, everything we say, how we behave, how we dress, all the things are judged by others, and we pay a lot of attention to that judgment. And if the judgment is not good, if you don't get an A, we try to improve. The best example I have is school, right? We put our, thing, uh, our kids into factories sorted by their manufacturing date. And we measure them year by year by their progress. As if they were mechanical things and not human beings. Right? We get accustomed and trained. I had this uh, Buddhist quote earlier on the slide. Uh, we, are, we are trained to not be ourselves in our society, in our workplaces, in school, in families. And it's a multi-generational influence that goes along, goes along, goes along. Example, my parents <coughs> tended to uh, bend at work, just, um, yeah. Uh, they accepted what was there, they accepted the way they were treated, they accepted the job they had, and they could take it home. That was the pattern I took it to work. So when I went into work, I thought that was normal, right? You accept what's there. And then I learned when I visited multiple organizations, I was thrown into a world of consultants, not according to my wishes, but it was very beneficial. So I saw multiple workplaces, and I saw that different companies are different, and people are different, and that there are actually people who change things. So I took the courage to do that too. So why are we so sensible to this? Why are we accepting this? There are two basic needs a human being has. There are more needs, but those two are the ones that are in competition and causing this struggle. One is the need to be ourselves, the need to be authentic, the need for authenticity. We talked about that already. On an organizational um, level, Stephen has been talking about the same problem that I'm talking now about on an individual level. The other need is attachment. We need community. We are community beings and we need connections to other human beings. And we frequently sacrifice our authenticity for attachment. This is the cause of all these false identities, of the uh, context switches that we have when we play different roles in life and behave differently when we are father, from when we are boss, or when we are colleague, or son. And, um, for instance, when my wife would call me now, I would probably answer my phone because I, it might be an emergency. Uh, I would not only change my language, I would change my tone of voice. The whole be behavior pattern of myself would totally change. You would notice that very visibly in, in the way I speak. Uh, we take, up, take on multiple identities. And we're not aware of that. We're not very good at switching. And we frequently carry stuff from one context into the other, which creates another kind of on an organizational level, this authenticity versus attachment thing becomes another dichotomy, the dichotomy between freedom and safety. The freedom to do the stuff I want to do, and the safety to be part of something that gives me money, that gives me uh, a house, food, and all the things. And Mostly, this is an explicit contract, right? This is a voluntary decision I take on the job. It doesn't matter if you're employed or freelancing. You take on a job, you sign a contract where you get a certain amount of money for a certain amount of freedom that you give up. The conscious part of this is not really a problem, right? Uh, I trade my time, my presence, my curiosity, my ideas for the money. Fair trade. Who of you has ever signed a contract which said, you occasionally need to do something you don't want to do. Really? It was in the contract? Written out? I yes? Yeah, extra hours. Okay, good thing. Did the contract cover all the things you later needed to do and didn't want to? <coughs> so there's a thing that comes with it, with this contract, with this situation. 
with this freedom for safety trade that we unconsciously do, that we don't talk about. And the effect of this is oppression. We feel oppressed and we don't feel ourselves at the moment. We feel we've given up something that belongs to us and someone else is taking it. <clears throat> Augusto Wall has written this beautiful definition of oppression. It's a situation where there could be dialogue, but there's only monologue. And this is ex exactly what I said, right? A contract, one thing, lots of additional things. The contract didn't say that I need to work with a colleague I don't like, for instance. Oppression is causing a lot of dysfunction in organizations and a lot of pain in human beings. Things you're told to do or things you think you have to do make up a lot of time in a lot of people's lives and work. Think about these questions. How much energy and time do you spend making sure you're looking good? Making sure something is not your fault? That is at its point this somebody else's problem behavior. Blowing on air, covering up bad news, covering your ass. I know this is a very exceptional conference, so I've skipped the uh, asking the crowd thing, but most conferences I've asked this question. Half of the people say that in their organization there's 50% of the energy spent on this shit instead of results. And that makes me very sad. I think that's the biggest source of waste you have in society and in organization. I really love this sentence, right? What we want is performance. Everybody is agreeing on that. Yeah. That's very capitalist, a capitalist value. But freedom is not. So, one of the messages I want to get across is what we're doing here is actually freeing people from, oppress uh, from oppression, releasing people from oppression. And if we're not conscious about this, um, if we are not in a maybe different phrasing, explicit about this, it's no wonder that senior management locks us out and says, this is not my business what you do there. This won't work here, right? Because we're making them afraid of this stuff we do. All the posters on the walls and things like that. One good thing is giving managers a choice, giving people a choice. Right? You all know the Morpheus moment, red pill, blue pill. Do you want to keep pretending? Or do you want to see how far the rabbit hole goes? This is exactly what Stephen told us earlier, in different words, right? We have the opportunity to keep up this number measure system, or we have the opportunity to actually satisfy our customer. Which do you want to choose? Right? And there are companies who say, no, no, we want to continue pretending. This is comfortable, but we don't dare to tell whoever is funding this company or whoever is my boss or whoever is my company or whatever. We don't want to risk, right? And that's a choice too, that's okay. I can't talk about choice without talking about real options. Who are you familiar with real options? Good, not too many. Okay. Um, real options is a kind of thinking framework, theory, thinking system, uh, made up by Chris Mack, and who's actually from here, uh, from London, and Olaf Maaßen from Holland. And it's basically three mantras that work together. The first one is options and value. On the surface, that's a very simple thing. You have multiple possibilities to act. Each of these gives you a certain value. It also has a certain cost. That's the uh, level of options training, right? When you read this from another perspective, it's more importantly telling you that it's very good to have options. Right? You don't want to be in the corner like this guy without a choice. That's the probably worst place you could be in as a human being. Recently we had this nice election in Europe, right? Most of you probably participated in that too. It was supposed to give me a choice and it didn't. Because of all, all of the options were shit. <laughs> right? 